you. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Equity Committee for Thursday, February 23rd, 2023. In accordance with Board Policy 8, 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done on by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting a discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Gover, please call the role of board members to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Dr. Savoy, Ms. Fast will do that. Thank you. I'm sorry. Okay. So, Dr. Savoy. Hi. Ms. Har Ms. Harvey. Present. Present. Miss Lichter. Present. Thank you. Okay. Miss Fast, please call the role of staff members on the committee participating in today's meeting. Uh, Dr. Yarborough. Present. Mr. Handy. Present. Thank you. Ms. Bass, please call and note the names of any additional staff members participating in the meeting. Mr. McCall. Present. Thank you. All righty. I now turn the meeting over to Mr. Douglas Handy. Thank you, Dr. Savoy. Uh, so this, this afternoon we have a presentation for the committee. Um, the presentation is aligned to our work as far as our strategic plan, our compass, and BCPS. It's also aligned to our system improvement teams, and it is focused on uh, recruiting and retaining a highly qualified and diverse workforce. So it's a topic that is of utmost importance at all times to make sure we have the staff that our students need and deserve in order to get a quality education. Um, and I'm very happy to bring with us this afternoon for the presentation, uh, Mr. Homer McCall. So I will turn it over to him uh, for the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Handy. Good afternoon, Board Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Savoy, and Dr. Yarborough, and others who are here. My name is Homer McCall II, and currently I'm serving as the Acting Senior Executive Director of Human Resources Recruiting and Staffing in Baltimore County Public Schools. Today I'll be presenting on some of the work the Department of Recruiting and Staffing within the Division of Human Resources of BCPS has done to build a highly effective and diverse workforce. Next slide, please. Briefly, as we set the stage for today's presentation, there are a few points that I would like to bring to mind. First, each year, school systems across America are finding it harder to recruit candidates for various teacher vacancies created through resignations. The state of Maryland is largely an importer of teacher candidates each year, with over 61% of all new hires new to teaching and experience being prepared at universities outside of Maryland. In addition, Baltimore County Public Schools, BCBS, participates in over 60 university visits, as well as a host of other recruiting events locally and in other states. Next slide, please. This presentation includes BCBS teacher demographic data from the current 22-23 and most recently completed school year 21-22, as well as historical data to identify trends and patterns. Also included, data regarding teacher movement, new hires and resignations are included, disaggregated by race, ethnicity, and gender. Detailed teacher resignation data are further explored to identify 
any meaningful actionable patterns that emerge. And then lastly, system improvement team recruitment and staffing work, specifically strategies 1A through 1C of the COMPASS, our pathway to excellence, to hire a diverse teacher workforce. Next slide, please. Before we move into the next few data slides, I want to highlight or bring to your attention the blueprint for Maryland's future and the clear alignment to the work of the COMPASS. Pillar two of the blueprint speaks to the high quality and diverse teachers and leaders. And the COMPASS specifically focus area three is our guide in BCPS to address a high performing workforce and the alignment of human capital. As stated here in the blueprint, on or before July 1st, 2022, each board, county board of education shall evaluate its hiring practices to determine if those practices are contributing to a lack of diversity in Maryland's teaching staff, make changes as appropriate, and then report those findings and propose changes to the governor and in accordance with 2-1257 of the state government article, the General Assembly and the accountability an implementation board established under section three of this act. Next slide. Please. As we begin to take our journey into the data this afternoon, I would like to begin with the BCPS school principals. As you see in 2017, we reported 168 schools. And within the 168 schools, 32 or 19% of the schools had black principals. 133 or 79.2% had white principals. And three or 1.8% had principals who identified as other, and that other would include Pacific Islander, Asian, or Latinx. From 2017 to 2021, we see a slight increase and then a slight decrease in the number of black principals. With the increase in the number of schools to 171, there was still an overall increase in the percentage to 19.3%. As we look at the number of white principals, the numbers oscillated. However, due to the increase in the number of schools, there was a slight net decrease in the percentage of white principals. This was also due in part to the increase in the number of principals who have self-identified as others. Those numbers increased from three in 2017 to six in 2021. Next slide, please. This particular slide takes a deeper dive to include gender along with race, ethnicity of our school principals over the same time frame of 2017 to 2021. The number of black females remained for the most part consistent at 27. The number of black male principals had a net increase of one. The number of white females, however, decreased from by four from 92 to 88. Whereas the number of white males increased by three from 41 to 44. Now in the case of our other female increased from two to five, whereas the other male remain consistent mm -hmm. at one. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. On this slide, we see the same information for our principles by gender, but depicted in a bar graph. The lighter blue represents the percentage of female principles and the darker blue represents the percentage of male principles from school year 2017 to 2018 to 2021 to 2022 over a five year span. The takeaway from this slide is that the role of the principal within BCPS as a profession remains heavily towards women. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to turn your attention to the race and ethnicity of BCPS assistant principals during the same time frame from 2017 to 2021. 
2017, we had 280 assistant principals. Of the 280, 80 or 28.6% were black, 191 or 68.2% were white, and 9 or 3.2% self identified as other. Now, fast forward no, to 2021, we had 286 assistant principals. And within the 286 assistant principals, we had a net increase of six black assistant principals representing 30.1%. In this same year, we had 190 white assistant principals, which was a net decrease of one assistant principal representing 66.4% still a majority. Lastly, there were 10 who self-identified as other with a net increase of one representing 3.5% of the total. Next slide, please. Now as we take a look into the race, race ethnicity, and gender, you will note that in 2016 has been added. However, for consistency, we'll look at 2017 to 2021 as we did in the previous slide. In 2017, there was an increase in the number of black female assistant principals, principals from 55 to 63 in 2021. There was a decrease in the number of black male APs from 25 to 23 in 2021. For our white administrators, there was a decrease in our white female assistant principals from 131 to 128. Hmm. However, there was an increase in our white male APs from 60 to 62 in 2021. For reporting our other female and male APs, we started with five and four respectively in 2017 and reported five other females and five other male APs in 2021. Next slide, please. This particular slide is a bar graph which shows the gender variation of our APs by date from school year 2017 to 2018 to school year 2021 to 2022. Once again, the light blue represents our female APs and the navy blue represents our male assistant principals. When we look at the gender percentages over the course of the five, year, five years, there's been less than a 1% shift favoring the number of female administrators. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to turn your attention to the data of race ethnicity for teachers for the 2017 to 2021 years. In 2017, we had a total of 7,366 teachers. Of the 7,366, 753 were black or 10.2%. 6,296 were white at 85.5%, and 317 self-identified as other as 4.3%. In 2021, the total number of teachers increased to 7,743, and of the 7,743, 1,006 were black teachers or 13%, which was an increase of 2.8%, 6,278 were white teachers, which was 81.1% or a decrease of a little over 4%, and 459 self-identified as other representing 5.9%. And this was an increase of 1.6%. Next slide, please. In this slide, I would like to turn your attention to race 
ethnicity, and gender. In 2017, there were 581 black female teachers, 172 black male teachers, 4,889 white female teachers, 1,407 white male teachers, 245 self-identified other female teachers, and 72 self-identified male other male teachers. When we look at 2021 among the same categories, we see that the number of black female teachers increased from 581 to 756. The number of black male teachers increased from 172 to 250. Our white female teachers, however, decreased from 4,889 to 4,852. The number of white male teachers increased from 14, of 1,407 to 1,426. The number of other female teachers increased from 245 to 356. And the, other, and the number of other male teachers increased from 72 to 103. Next slide, please. In this slide, we're looking at the gender of our teachers from school year 2017, 2000, 2017 to 2018 to school year 2021 to 2022. These bar graphs show our female teachers in the light blue and our white and our male teachers in the navy blue. Once again, we see about a 0.5% increase in the percentage of male teachers from 22.41% to 22.98%. Nevertheless, the teaching profession remains dominated here within BCPS as it is nationally by our female educators here in BCPS. Next slide, please. Now this particular slide shows our teacher separation by race, ethnicity for school years 21-22 and 2022-2023 year to date. When you look at school year 2021 to 22, the largest group of resignations and retirements come from our white and our black teachers followed by our Hispanic and Asian, then two or more races followed by our Alaska Native American Indian. For the current school year, year to date, follows a similar pattern with our largest group of resignations and retirements coming from our white and our black teachers. Next slide, please. As we look at the reasons why our teachers left in 2021 to 2022, we note that the largest reason stated for leaving is to seek other employment, followed by moving in darker purple, then cause unknown in Navy, then home responsibility, which you see in the orange, then dissatisfied with position in the lighter purple. Others include personal illness, attending school, separation end of the retire rehire contract, and then regular re retirement. Next slide, please. This slide shows year-to-date separation reasons for our teachers this school year. Once again, you'll see that the main reason that teachers leave to date is to seek other employment, mm -hmm. followed by cause unknown in the navy blue, then by personal illness, it's in the gold, home responsibilities in orange, dissatisfied with the position in the light of purple, followed by moving, resign from leave, and attending school.
Next slide, please. Now, this slide is probably one of the most telling slides in the entire presentation. What you see here is a graph of the student enrollment by race ethnicity on the left, juxtaposed to the school based employees by race ethnicity on the right, followed over the course of five years. When we look at school year 2017 2018, we see that 39.1% of our students were black. 38.69% of our students were white. 9.69% of our students were Hispanic. 7.1% of our students were Asian. Roughly 5% were two or more races, which would include also Alaskan and American Indian. This same school year for our school-based staff, an overwhelming 84.57% of our staff was white, with 11.43% of our staff was black, with only 4% representing all other races or ethnicities. Now, when we fast forward to school year 2021-2022, we see a slight shift in the student demographics. Our black students represented 40.37% of the entire student population. Our white students represented 32.8% of our student population. This was then followed by Hispanic students. Our Hispanic students experienced the largest growth over five year span at over 4% increase. Now transitioning back to the same school year for our school-based staff, there were some shifts in these demographics as well. During the 2021-2022 school year, our white staff consisted of 80.64%, followed by a far distant 13.64%, which comprised of our black staff. Then a little over 5% makes up our Asian, two or more races, Alaskan Native American. Next slide, please. As we think about the previous slide and how we have seen a slight shift in our two largest groups of school based staff, we see here on the left our new hires for school year 2021. 2022 by race. Our largest group of new hire, new teacher hires were our white teachers at 544, followed by our black teachers at 280, Hispanic teachers at 50, our Asian teachers at 31, followed by two or more races at 16. Pacific Islander and Native American at five and four respectively. On the right is a chart of our new hires by gender for the 2021-2022 school year. As you will see, new hires remain overwhelmingly female at 718 and male at 212. Next slide, please. This particular slide shows our new hires by race as well as by gender for the current 2021, excuse me, 2022-2023 school year. The one thing to note from this slide is the number of new hires, which is 1,152, which is up from the previous school year of 930 new hires. Of the 1,152, our white teacher new hires make up 55% which is a decrease from the previous year of 58%. In contrast, the percentage of our new hired black teachers increased from 30% to almost 35%. Our percentage of Hispanic teachers remain approximately the same at 5%. When comparing the genders of our new hires from school year 2021 to 2022 to school year 2022-23, we noticed a slight increase in the number of male teacher new hires from 20.8 to 
to 25.35%. Next slide, please. Which brings us to the compass. Now, in July of 2020, the Board of Education adopted a new strategic plan for the system called the compass, our pathway to excellence. As you know, there are five focus areas. Learning, accountability and results. Safe and supportive environment. High performing workforce and alignment of human capital community engagement and partnerships, and then lastly, operational excellence. Focus Area 3 targets our efforts to recruit and retain a qualified, highly effective and diverse workforce and create a system-wide professional development plan to improve work performance. On the next few slides, I was sharing with you some of the work the system improvement team recruitment and staffing has done to recruit and a qualified and highly effective diverse workforce. Specifically, we'll be looking at key initiative one, recruitment source and partnerships strategies 1A through 1C. Next slide, please. We understand learning is our core purpose. In order for our students to achieve at high levels, we must be grounded in a strong equity framework. The Compass establishes system-wide commitments to equity. These commitments include increasing the diversity of our teacher workforce. In our equity action statement, we share that we're committed to using an equity lens in our recruitment, hiring, retention, and promotion processes. Our data indicate the need to examine, interrupt, and redesign systems and structures which will lead to a workforce that is aligned with the diversity of our students by focusing on recruiting and retaining educators of color. Next slide, please. Some of the areas we've looked at as a system improvement team under staffing and recruitment have been recruitment looked at retention, promotional pathways, as well as our staffing standards. As we dive into further into the strategies under key initiative one, recruitment source and partnerships, I'd like to turn your attention to strategy 1A, discuss define quality measures of success and build successful monitoring tools, for tracking, tracking effectiveness of recruitment sources and methods. I'll be sharing just a few of those things we are proud that we've accomplished under this strategy. In addition to some of those things we're in the process of accomplishing, and lastly, what are some of the challenges we must overcome? Some of those things that we're proud of, we've met the teacher workforce diversity goal as originally planned in the compass. We revised our HBCU, our Historically Black College University Recruitment Plan by looking at some of those things that we can do differently that we've done in the past. Completed the Administrator Alumni Report, looking at where our administrators have finished their, either their undergrad or the graduate programs, and then including them on our recruitment efforts. Developed and posted our recruitment schedule online so that everyone can see where we're attending we receive feedback from our uh, principals at various di at a different levels, elementary, middle, and high school, understanding that we must move quicker uh, through our staffing calendar and timeline in order to be able to attract and recruit some of the best talent that's out there as we're in competition with other districts. We've established a partnership with Howard University School of Education, had the opportunity to work with their Teacher Education Advisory Council, which meets quarterly, with other districts there in attendance as well. We've conducted over 230, 230 interviews, which has yielded to date 184 candidates in the pool. 
Keep in mind that we're just starting really for the most part through the fall as we're ramping up for our spring recruitment events. Some of the things that we're in the process of planning is our annual BCBS teacher job fair, which would be at the Maryland State Fairgrounds on March 8th. We're gathering teacher recruitment data from our recruitment events, looking at the number of people who are visiting our tables. And from that, who's visiting our table, how many are actually going through the interview process and entering our pool, and how many are actually being offered advanced contracts and accepting those advanced contracts. We also organize our classroom visits for education and uneducation majors. We are 22 and 23 school year. Oh. Keep it in mind, as I mentioned before, our education majors are actually uh, on the decline. So we're looking at also our math as well as science majors to uh, recruit into education. Diversifying our teacher interview panels is another thing that we've been uh, doing as well. A lot of times when we interview, we want to make sure that we are showing or reflecting not only just our demographics of our staff, but really of our of our students as well. We're utilizing Handshake, which is another online recruitment platform. This particular platform allows us to be more proactive in our recruitment efforts. And then contracting interns with advanced contracts, which I'll talk a little bit more about in the next couple of slides as well. But keeping in mind that we still have as I don't like to think of them as as problems, but if you look at the, the PR, we're using the alliteration here, proud process problem. We look at the teacher national teacher shortage that has been a challenge for many school districts, not just here in Baltimore County, but across the nation. And understanding too that teachers are in the driving seat right now. Even though they may be in our pool, they may be in other pools as well. So we have to move a lot quicker than we have in the past. So teacher, employee, and they understand it is an employee market. Next slide, please. Several proud moments for this year include initiatives to support our interns under strategy 1B or teacher intern recruitment to include our two recently retired administrators continue to support our recruitment and selection efforts for our student interns, including the updating our screening interview process to ensure that all student interns are screened at the school prior to the end of their intern experience. BCPS has partnered with our college and universities to approve on a limited basis student interns to work concurrently as long term substitutes in the classroom. Process has been communicated to our partners and principals to allow for streamlined hiring processes. Our processes reflect is ongoing and find as the school progresses. We continue to implement the on site screening interviews for student interns this spring, and have staff available from HR to go out to schools and support these efforts as needed. As mentioned before, advanced contracts are going out each out earlier this year and HR staff is available to speak with our interns about this process. Next slide, please. Under strategy 1C, expand professional development schools, especially partnerships with historically black colleges, and universities, which provide college internships and with a focus on high needs schools. This school year, we're proud to share that the Office of Teacher Development the Office of Certification have connected with local HBCUs, specifically Bowie State University, Coppin State University, and Morgan State. We're planning to build new partnership schools or expand existing partner school sites continues into the second half of the academic school year. Rossville Elementary School has been formally identified as a partner school with Morgan State. Chatfield Early Learning Center and Randallstown Elementary have been identified as partner schools with Coppin State University. An MOU or Memorandum of Understanding is currently under review by both BCPS and Coppin's law offices and pending final approval. This MOU is required for placement of full system se semester interns completing a supervised practicum experience in established partner schools. We're in the process during the spring of 2023. Student, in, in, student teachers in their second and third year are being placed in field experiences 
They're on average one day to one week in length. These experiences will allow BCPS to establish a pipeline that starts with students beginning their teacher preparation programs with the HBCU partners. Additionally, institutions are working to coordinate training with site coordinators to provide professional development sessions with mentor teachers. These activities could provide leadership opportunities that could tie to our career ladder. Some of the challenges, as mentioned before, Nationally, there's been a decline in enrollment in teacher preparation programs. This is not uncommon with our local colleges and universities. As BCPS moves forward to expand its partnerships with HBCUs, we're identifying creative solutions to increase potential teachers' interest in starting a career with our school system. One consideration is the placement of teacher apprentices and or teacher fellows in BCPS schools. These placements provide opportunities for the on the job experience of students completing their final practicum. A teacher apprenticeship is another is another option for student teachers to complete practicum experiences and also earn an income. Additionally, the problem regarding the location of HBCUs and or availability of transportation has been raised as a concern. The location of partner schools could be a barrier for students and will be taken into consideration as partnerships continue to grow. Next slide, please. This slide just shows some of the universities and organizations that BCPS has partnered with in order to move the work forward in building a diverse teacher workforce. Next slide. In closing, as we continue the work of Focus Area 3 of the Compass, our pathway to excellence, high performing workforce and alignment of human capital, we're mindful of our purpose, which is to recruit and retain a qualified, highly effective and diverse workforce. We are committed to using an equity lens in our recruitment hiring, retention, and promotion processes. We believe that every child in BCPS, regardless of race, will benefit from a highly effective and diverse teacher workforce. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time this afternoon. Any questions? Uh, thank you. This is a uh, uh, board member Harvey. Uh, I have a, a few questions, if you uh, bear with me. I appreciate the detail in your presentation. Thank you for that. Um, so can you tell me what the equity goals are? Do you have a percentage? You pointed out the disparities between what the student population looks like and what the staff population looks like. Is your goal to move it closer by a certain percentage? And what are those? It's a very good question. As a matter of fact, we uh, had met the original goals in the, in the compass, but we are in the process of realigning those goals to make it even more aggressive. It is to ultimately, we like to make it reflective of what our student population is. But as you can see, it's taking um, baby steps to get there. Uh, we are looking, if you notice on the dates, each of the years that we have that's been listed there, we're using the uh, the dates that's actually reported to state staffing. So each year we are trying to at least get at least a one to two percent increase in uh, in our um, African American or Black teachers to ultimately hopefully get to where we're reflecting more of what the student population looks like. So so we're. I'm sorry. I appreciate that. How did you how did you come up with one to two percent per year? How did you come up with that as a reasonable goal? So because, as go ahead. I'm sorry. Because we're at we're at about twenty seven percent um disparity in African American teachers and um nine percent in Latino yeah. teachers. I I'm not gonna look at the the male teachers as well. There's, you know, so we're looking at, you know, 
over a decade before we start approaching equity. So where is the one to two percent coming from? What's the what's the rationale behind that as a percentage for increase or and, change? And that's, <laughs> that's no worries. No, absolutely. That was originally as it was planned in the in the compass that we had before we did meet those goals. But we are trying to adjust those to make it even more aggressive to try to at least be more reflective. That would take a lot more time if we were just to use the one to two percent. But originally we did meet those goals in the compass. We did have the one to two percent. Now I apologize if I didn't quite understand the question. No, but, that's OK. That, yeah. that, that helps. Uh, yeah. My next question is. Uh, I appreciate the data in the quantity, but also part of this is uh, quality when we talk about equity across our our staff that are teaching our young people. So in the beginning, I believe you said 61% of um, our teachers are new hires or new to the profession. Uh, then I heard that we we have a program to fast track to use student interns as long term subs to feed into the pipeline of teachers um, for our young people. So my question is really about quality um, and professional development. And how do we, how are we equitably, how do we assign professional development staff now? And have we assessed that that method is the most equitable practice, particularly when there may be a large concentration of new staff or and or long subs at yeah. certain schools yeah. rather than others? Very good question. So in fact, during this time is with our, our all of our new hires, all of our teachers who are coming in, regardless of whether or not they're career changers or they're going through a teacher education program, do receive uh, uh, a consulting teacher also in their uh, during their training. As you mentioned before about the um, the teachers through the during the internship as long term subs, that was a pilot program we had with Towson University. And with that, they were able to serve as long term subs. That was just this past or actually within the year that we're in. And so we haven't gotten to the point where we actually hired them because they were in their internship, but they were released to be uh, to be long term subs. So with that, the other piece that I want to also bring to, to light, I only specifically talked about one A through one C and I will share that piece. There's another part of the uh, of the group that is with our group two. A through 2C, uh, which talks about really the retention piece as well. What are we doing to help retain? We know that one of the best things, uh, best recruitment plans, they have a good retention plan. So we do have a group that also works specifically with retention. And part of that work is with their professional development is what you were just uh, talking about as well. So I'd be glad to uh, bring some of that information back or present on that and a, uh, in, a in another setting as well. But there's a lot of work that we do with with retention as well, and I could have my counterpart here with uh, tell with presenting that information. OK, I, I appreciate that. Um, my interest, just so I'm clear, is that um, I'm not quite clear on how professional development staff are assigned, if it's strictly based on numbers, um, which I, I think that's what I my understanding is. Okay. But uh, it seems to me if we were looking at uh, equity in relation to retention, especially in relation to to um, diverse uh, teaching, our diverse diverse population of staff, that those resources would be allocated in a way that is um, supporting new uh, and uh, new hires, new teachers to the profession. Uh, and uh, uncertificated teachers, teachers who are long term subs and. Where those teachers are concentrated, so should that development be. So I'm not sure what that looks like now, but it seems to me when we talk about equity 
equity and really saying that equity is not equal. Equity is giving everyone the same opportunity. So if you have a school that has a high percentage of tenured teachers, right. tenured experienced right. teachers, and they have a dedicated professional development staff, but you have a school that has a high turnover rate of teachers and therefore has a lot of new teachers and right. they don't have a professional development, a dedicated professional development staff, that becomes a problem because the quality is different at those two schools based on the experience of the teaching staff. So that's something I'm very interested in learning more about. Absolutely. And part of that too, Ms. Harvey, if you will, um, some of our schools, especially our Title I schools, do have staff development teachers assigned to them. And then, as I mentioned before about the consulting teachers, um, on the staffing side of things, we do monitor those things when it comes to our transfer process, our teacher transfer process. When you're looking at, say, for instance, voluntary transfers, we don't want this massive exodus from our schools who are the most challenging, some of the most challenging issues to go to the schools that were deemed less challenging or high performing. So we do put parameters in place from the staffing side of the house to uh, to make sure that we don't have that um, those those unintended consequences down the road. But there is uh, uh, other work that's being done by teacher development that also exists with those um, the professional development that's being um, given to our teachers and where those uh, um, efforts are being concentrated. But like I said, of course, that is on the uh, more of the uh, organizational effective side of the house. Yes, ma'am. Good question. So thank you. Thank you. Dr. Savoy, if I may. Um, I should have put something in the chat. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Spoy can hear me. I just wanted to uh, ask Dr. Yarbrough to also respond. Uh, I think she might have something to add to this particular question from Ms. Harvey. So don't yes, want to speak out of turn, but okay. So Dr. Right. Yarbrough. Dr. Savoy, is that okay? Can you guys hear me? Yes, we yeah. can hear you. Okay. 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 Dr. Yarbrough. Thank you, Dr. Savoy. Uh, Vice Chair uh, Harvey, I did want to um, provide some additional information. Mr. McCall is correct in that work happens in organizational effectiveness. And just to provide an overview, yes, as we certainly. hire teachers, thank you, Dr. Savoy. <laughs> uh, sorry for the delay. As we hire new teachers, um, one of the things that happens between staffing and the Office of Teacher uh, Leadership is that we look to find out their years of experience. Based on their years of experience, they might be assigned a consulting teacher, and that consulting teacher is the person that works with them for the entire year. Um, if they are transferring to us and have some experience from another district, they might receive a peer advisor in their building. And on top of that, the program that uh, Mr. McCall was talking about that we uh, piloted this summer in an effort with uh, Towson, with Morgan, and I think it was one other school that we met with, those are the teachers that have all of their teacher training. And ideally, if we weren't in a pandemic, they would have been in the classroom with a lead teacher. They would have taught for a portion of the year, observed for the portion of the year. What we did, as well as some other districts, is work with our education partners to pilot a program where they were teaching as long-term subs full-time, but the university sent out someone that was providing them support. And we also, from our uh, cadre of uh, peer assistance and review, had um, advisors, if you will, for them. And I believe they met a minimum of three times per week where they observed their teaching and gave them feedback because it's the university goal as well as our goal that they are successful the first time around. Mm -hmm. Additionally, when it comes to conditional teachers, we have a few hundred conditional teachers that we hired. The Office of Teacher Leadership, not only do we provide those cohort opportunities, we also provide year round what we're calling new educators orientation on those subjects. Uh, that comes up uh, for the majority of teachers, whether we're talking about, you know, positive classroom discipline, we're talking about lesson planning, we're talking about how do you unscramble confusion, uh, clarity and expectations. We provide those year round where those teachers mm -hmm. are paid. Um, 
the additional layer that we provided this year is because we are trying to manage the social emotional well-being of everyone and retain the teachers that we have is we came across all divisions curriculum and instruction teacher leadership organizational development um, and of course uh, my division to talk about what are all the offerings we have for all of our teachers how do we place in some of the schools like you're speaking to with large numbers of new teachers, how do we place a um, staff development teacher there or a consulting teacher that is your home base? Um, we also did some differentiation in terms of resources at the beginning of the year where our consulting teachers, instead of last year, they filled in throughout the year as these absences came up related to COVID. Um, instead of doing that, we made a proactive plan four days a week, they were working on their consulting teacher roles one day a week based on the number of vacancies. So exactly as you're talking about an equitable approach based on who had the most needs. There was a consulting teacher that was assigned on Fridays until you know those positions were filled and that's where the consulting teacher was providing support to the school, but also providing an opportunity the new teachers could go and watch them in action as the experts in uh, content and the experts with teaching. So we have a detailed coordinated plan of support that goes across all the divisions that we can certainly share in a follow up. But I, I didn't want us to move, uh, leave this moment without you having details about uh, the kind of support that we are providing uh, in addition to staff development teachers that sometimes you can purchase through uh, special revenue funds, uh, whether it's ESSA grant or it's um, uh, Title I funds, uh, you know, as some have mentioned, uh, those are directly uh, tied to the schools. But in addition to that, we have that central uh, support that we've been providing throughout this year. Uh, is it enough? Uh, there's never enough, but there um, it is quite robust and happy to follow up with uh, the document that will show you all of the schools and all of the layers of support that we're providing to our new teachers. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate mm -hmm. that uh, additional information that that is helpful in, in painting a, a, a clearer picture of me of uh, how teachers are being supported, but I would like to to see the plan as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Dr. Savoy, I don't have any questions. Okay, the chair recognizes Mrs. Littner. I, I was just letting you know I didn't have any questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. That's okay. Anybody else have questions? No. Okay. This was a great meeting, very informative. Go ahead. Oh no, I, I'm I'm fine. I was <laughs> yielding to you, ma'am. Okay. Thank you for that excellent presentation. Are there any other questions? No. 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 Nope. I think we're okay. no no other questions. Looks like Dr. Zavoy. Okay. I was just gonna. Oh, Very I, I'll, informative. You, you, Go ahead. Just gonna cover um our future topics whenever you're ready. So. Okay. The last item. Oh, you want to cover future topics at this time? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. All right. So here on the screen, just have um, our future topics for the remainder of our school year. Um, second bullet is our hiring practices diversity, which um, presentation we had this evening. So I want to thank Mr. McCall again for the presentation. Um, in addition to this one, we also will be bringing to you uh, echo actions in school, school system, and school board. Um, that'll be a more of a professional development for committee members. Um, I'll be facilitating that uh, really around applying our equity lens and giving some opportunity for the committee members to have some discussion around how to apply equity lens to make these decisions um, that are being made every day within your positions, of course, within our schools as well. Uh, we'll also talk about the equity training that my team and I uh, facilitate 
uh, for BCPS staff. We want to give you all some some detail and insight on that. Um, and then we also will be bringing a presentation on um, academic goals that we have as a system, including um, advanced placement or AP, um, SAT, and also graduation rate. Um, so you can look forward to uh, those presentations this year. Um, hopefully you'll uh, find some good information and an opportunity for discussion. Uh, any questions on those at this point? And Dr. Savoy, I will pass it back to you for announcements. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. It was an excellent presentation. If You're there welcome. are no questions, um, the last item on the agenda was announcements. I think we had the May. Yes. Okay, the last item on the agenda is announcements. The next equity committee meeting will be held on Thursday, March 23rd, 2023 at 4 p.m. And the next equity committee meeting will be with the equity council will be held on Thursday, March 9th, 2023 at 5.30 p.m. Is there, is there any future Further business. It, is there any further business? Further business. All right. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you for joining us today. Have a good evening. Thank you, everybody. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.